Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Wiley Knight. I'm uh, pleased to panel this chair, uh, which is about technology and effective logistics. Um, I'm the Director of Humanitarian Aid for Radiant Logistics, which is a global uh, 3PL uh, and uh, headquartered in, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, over the past over the past 30 years, I've been in the business, uh, and, and um, this past 15 years, I've been concentrating on humanitarian aid, disaster relief, government, uh, government uh, assistance, and, and things to that nature. So um, I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where I started out in business, and um, would like to welcome the panel. Um, the first up would, is Mr. Jaime Pozo. Um, Mr. Jaime, would you introduce yourself, please? Yeah. I am Jaime Pozo. I am Director of Administration in SINAPRO, Sistema Nacional de Protección Civil. We have a government organization that so have the, the, the function to, to make the, the rescues and uh, manage uh, uh, the, the emergency. A natural emergency specific when we have a, a flood storm road obstruction uh, we work to to help the people uh, my function in the Sinapro is to see the administration and the uh, technology development and our, our next panel will be mr ben tisdale uh welcome mr tisdale would you like to introduce yourself please Ben Dinsdale, Global Cargo Director for Humanitarian and Government Services for Air Charter Service. We are a global aircraft charter broker providing cargo and passenger flights. We've also got a travel division, an onboard courier department, and an ACMI department. Uh, we work in all of the major charter markets such as oil and gas, automotive, aerospace, among others. But one thing we've always focused very heavily on is aid and relief. And in my time with the company since the early 2000s, I've seen some big developments across that sector, uh, right up to the most recent with, of course, the COVID pandemic. Uh, and uh, the next panelist is Francisco Casada. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thank you, uh, <clears throat> Ian, uh, for Anor for for inviting me to a, a new panel this year. Uh, I'm Francisco Quesada. I'm the uh, United Nations Humanitarian Response Depots uh, Manager in Panama City. Uh, and uh, well, I, I take care for uh, you, uh, the humanitarian response of United Nations and the uh, humanitarian community in Latin America and the Caribbean region. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and then we have Mr. Phil Hassel. Um, so I'm Phil Hassel. I do business development for Leonardo DRS. Uh, DRS is a global communications integrator. We're the uh, largest provider of satellite communication solutions to the U.S. government. We support a variety of uh, relief organizations, including aid, uh, USAID, FEMA. Uh, we support a lot of remote African, uh, Alaskan tribes as well, um, and the African Union also. Okay, welcome. Um, and then we have uh, Mr. Howard, uh, Edward Meck. Edward Meck, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Edward Meck. I am the team leader for the freight forwarding team in the United Nations uh, Procurement Division. Um, I've been with the UN system for 20 years uh, as a procurement officer. And I have a total of 34 years uh, procurement experience in the private and uh, public sector. Uh, at the moment, I'm responsible for the freight forwarding of all secretarial related uh, shipments um, for contingent on equipment, which is the shipment by sea or by air charter for equipment that is owned by uh, troop contributing countries in the peacekeeping operations. I'm responsible for the shipment of that equipment to 
the theater and back to the troop contributing country. At the same time, I'm also responsible for um, regular uh, uh, freight forwarding services or requirements for United Nations on equipment. This is equipment that we are buying from uh, our vendors, our suppliers. So we also do the shipment for those. Um, we do a lot of um, air charter. We are also handling the COVID-19 related uh, shipments for the Secretariat, the vaccines, um, the test kits, the PPE, and all those other uh, requirements. So anything for the Secretariat, New York based, to the field or to any of the Secretary offices we do. Thank you. Um, I'm Wiley Knight. I'm with Radiant Logistics. Uh, we're a global 3PL headquartered in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I'm the Director of Humanitarian Aid, and uh, we are a uh, uh, publicly traded company that uh, we service all sectors of businesses. Uh, we also are very active in humanitarian aid, disaster relief, government, uh, government uh, shipments. Uh, we were the number two air bridge partner for FEMA uh, during the months of March and, uh, and June of last year. Um, and we're very active in uh, humanitarian aid around the COVID response, including movement of test kits and uh, other, other commodities around COVID. Uh, we also uh, respond to some of the most remote areas of the world, uh, providing door-to-door -door solutions. Thank you. Okay, so um, on this panel, uh, our discussion is going to be around the uh, technology uh, and effective logistics, especially with uh, in today's environment, which is uh, really uncharted waters, I think. I think there, uh, all of us would probably agree with that. Um, with uh, uh, the, the COVID-19 um, and how it has affected our, uh, the, not only the, uh, the, tech, uh, the logistics, but also how technology uh, has been affected with that, trying to catch up with uh, the ever-changing uh, uh, world of, of uh, providers that we have that and challenges that we have in countries. Um, as, as, as we all know, uh, COVID has, uh, <clears throat> has, has, you know, it has basically um, caused a, a, uh, a, a major change in the way that we look at handling humanitarian aid, logistics. Uh, we also are looking at uh, major delays when it comes to uh, ocean freight, air freight, uh, co uh, planes are being grounded due to uh, pilots and their crew getting COVID. Ocean carriers are now uh, uh, many, some months behind in shipments uh, due to the shutdown of China and the Far East. And now they're reopening and the economies are reopening. Uh, and then also the, the infrastructure within countries that are being affected heavily by COVID is being challenged due to the fact of labor and uh, to unload these uh, aircraft, ocean carriers also receive the freight. So how we, as we as uh, professionals, how do we, how do we, uh, you know, how, you know, uh, uh, how do we, you know, live in this new world that we have? Um, it's probably not going to change. This is probably going to be the new normal. Uh, and uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, you know, supply, the supply chains continue to be uh, disrupted by COVID. Um, you know, the, uh, the cross-border tra trade uh, in between countries is being disrupted. Uh, you know, some countries are, have completely blocked off any cross-border trade to avoid cross-contamination. Um, also, the accuracy of, of the uh, technology today is being disrupted because uh, the train, the uh, planes and uh, ocean carriers, or even the trucks, uh, are not running on normal schedules anymore. Uh, there's a lot of variables now that we did not have to deal with before, um, and uh, and you know the lack of available personnel um, at these airports to unload aircraft, as we saw with uh, during the. Uh, the major push back in March when the world knew about COVID and the whole world was trying to move cargo out of China. 
uh, into into regions. Uh, there were there weren't enough aircraft and weren't enough personnel. You had uh, customs challenges because customs was either closed or there was a lot of disruption as far as you know the commodities were the commodities even approved to be exported. Um, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of unknowns uh, that we're dealing with now on a daily basis. Uh, countries are constantly changing their regulations on uh, on how to bring in product around COVID and or any product um, to avoid cross contamination of of uh, their uh, their citizens. And then uh, you know how how do we look at lead times? How do we look at lead times as far as shipment lead times? Um, you can no longer, I mean, we're in a different, we're in a world of where schedules have really been, uh, they're, they're, you can't live by them any longer. So technology from that end, how, do, how, do, how does that, uh, uh, how do we come around that in order to respond to these, these global disasters? Because they will continue. Um, and um, so I think this is something really major. I know we're seeing it from our side at, at Radiant. Uh, we're also seeing it with our uh, our government clients and our NGOs. Uh, you know, uh, there's 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 longer lead times. There's a lot of uncertainty with even getting supply to to fly out because their suppliers are being challenged um, or or to put out on the ocean. And when uh, you do get the supply, do you have the available aircraft? Do you have the available container list? Do you have the available truckers? Because the trucking industry, uh, especially Europe, uh, Europe and the U.S., has been hit very hard uh, around COVID to move supplies as uh, these truckers go down with the uh, with the illness. So uh, those are the types of things that you know I think uh, would be good to kind of talk about. And wanted to you know get some input from the the panel as you know to what you guys are seeing um, around that um, that aspect. Uh, well, yeah, if I, if I may, just quickly, the, uh, I completely agree. The, as we know, the, around about 50 or more percent of the world's cargo was moving on the belly capacity of passenger aircraft pre-COVID. And with the, the, um, the absolute lack of travel that there has been ever since the COVID response started, all of that capacity has literally fallen away. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the scheduled airlines are doing what they can to pick up the pieces, but they're absolutely maxed out, which leaves very little real freight capacity on the market for, for moving cargo around. And, you know, there's more cargo that needs to move, it seems, with the PPE that has been moving and then more recently testing kits and then moving forward, it's going to be vaccines, which the vaccines, I can only see that's going to require full freighter capacity, even more than the testing kits and the PPE, which can potentially move on passenger aircraft. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, They're talking about 8,000 aircraft <laughs> just for the vaccine. Yeah, which is yeah. it's a hell of a number. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, obviously, since the beginning of, of the crisis and, and more and more as time's gone on, we've seen the emergence of using passenger aircraft, commercial jets in, in whatever form they come. To start off with, it was, it was just any any aircraft that was prepared to put cargo on their seats and in the overhead lock lockers. And then the airline started to remove seats, which has brought along these freighters, if you like, passenger freighters, uh, which, which has actually brought into the market a whole new type of solution for certain types of cargo. So I agree that I can't see that things are going to change anytime soon. This is probably the new normal for certainly for 2021. Yeah. And, and from a technology side, uh, you know, I, 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 from a transportation side, uh, sector, uh, I don't think our technology was developed to deal with 
these types of anomalies that we're dealing with today. Uh, you know, as far as like lead times and building out lead times, looking at schedules, uh, and you know, we now have uh, ocean carriers that are uh, that are canceling vessels, uh, vessel strings, uh, blank sailings, which is backing up cargo in these transshipment points. Uh, so if you're going into Africa, uh, coming out of the U.S., you may get stuck in Singapore for 30, 40 days or longer for the transshipment point. So those are the types of challenges that have we have never, uh, as an industry, I don't think we've ever faced. Uh, and it's kind of the perfect storm also with the world economy, uh, and especially in Europe and the U.S., is doing quite well. So, you know, it's, uh, and as the, 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 uh, the factories start to ramp up, uh, their production, it's now, now you're competing against space against the, uh, you know, the commercial industry for, uh, during a humanitarian aid disaster. We saw a little bit of that here in the U.S. back in, uh, back in hurricane season uh, because of the COVID response and uh, the available truckers and the backlog at the ports. Uh, you know, we were constantly competing for, for carriers to, to deliver cargo. Well, in a, in a, a semi-automated transport system, you're right, the, there is very little room for anomalies like this, where in a normal disaster situation, there is, there's an ebb and a flow of communication that goes with the terrain and you have to react on a human it's only a human that can make the decisions sometimes between what needs to happen next in terms of the situation, um, I don't know, the situation at an airport or the situation on the ground somewhere that means that you, you have to adapt to the situation. And I guess that the, the computer models and the, the automation can't cope with multiple countries or multiple ports slowing down or stopping altogether. Absolutely. So, um, and, I, and I'm sure, you know, our, um, you know, the, the UN is feeling the same thing as you look at a, you know, a much glo at a global scale that you guys respond on. So I'd like to get your feedback, uh, Edward, and see what uh, you have oh. to say about it. Sure. Um, we are having serious problems contractually and operationally. Um, when it comes to these uh, changes. So you find that trucks carrying our cargo equipment are uh, detained at the border. They have to, you know, most of the operations are in Africa, the ones that we're dealing with. Right. So these are stuck, you find trucks are stuck at the border. Right. There are those truck detention charges. And there's these sort of disputes with the companies in terms of the planning, what happened, how it happened. Um, so we, we get those delays. At the same time, rates are changing, say for the ocean part of uh, shipment. We, 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 either we cannot get space or where we had space, we are told that the rates have changed. If we don't place a contract immediately upon receiving the, 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 the rates, you know, the price has changed. And- yeah, three, three to 500%. Exactly. Three to 500% more just, just to get on a vessel. And this yeah. is public procurement. Uh, uh, that we are doing. So there are certain right. systems that we have to follow and they have to catch up, you know. With, exactly. Uh, it's so so it's it has become a challenge for us. And right. other, another issue that we have uh, encountered is on the cold chain side of things. Mm -hmm. Now we have to ship cold chain, uh, say, vaccines, test kits, um, you know, into certain regions which don't have proper infrastructure. Right. And at the same time, there's a limitation in the number of uh, transporters or aircraft that go into those countries. Some countries, it's only one international flight a week, and we're all fighting for the same space. Right. And right. in the past, of course, I guess, you know, technology could help. You could see what are the best lanes, what are the best, um, what's available on the market, but that's all disrupted. We, we, we cannot really use any of that in, in, in the moment. Yeah. So, um, you know, and, and maybe... Um... From a technology side, um, I, I'm not. Um, who would want to maybe pick up on some points around technology as far as maybe what some solutions are around this, and maybe some developments from the technology side to help catch up 
um, you know, the uh, humanitarian aid disaster response industry um, to what's going on in today's world and today's current events. Phil, would you want to add to that or uh, Francisco or? You know, I, I think that uh, with the technology side, we don't interface so much with, with, with the logistics, but we see uh, similar challenges and unique challenges based on this. Um, for starters, you know, we, we have this world, we have this global infrastructure, but, but maintaining it does require us to travel sometimes. And trying to get somewhere out to a remote location uh, has just become far more challenging. Um, you know, we, we had initial issues. Uh, our, our shipments are nowhere near the size of, uh, as, as the other panels are, are managing. Um, but for the first 30 days, we had some challenges. Um, after that, we, we found some fairly reliable delivery, uh, delivery methods um, for, for our smaller, you know, pallet and, and less size loads. Mm -hmm. um, however, the, the challenge became with, with everyone working remotely, nobody was able to receive a shipment and, and process it. Uh, additionally, I, I think with the, with the technology, uh, you know, having to suddenly switch from working, working in office to working remotely, uh, just, just our maintainer operations was, was a, a massive challenge for us. But on top of that, we had customers who were having to leverage our infrastructure uh, to, uh, to, to support remote learning. Um, so a lot of the remote villages in, in, in Alaska ended up going to remote learning. And, and we, had to, uh, we ended up uh, at no cost increasing the bandwidth to, to those villages over our microwave network. In order to uh, in order to support that, strangely enough, there was actually a, a, an FCC rule that prevented us from giving them free bandwidth. It was, it was considered a gift, and it was a violation. So we had to get a special waiver for that as well, um, which is a, it's 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 definitely a, a unique set of challenges uh, that have really presented ourselves and and uh, have challenged us to to overcome and, and maintain that that ongoing service. Okay, thank you. Um, and from the side of Cineproc, I know this uh, past year you've been uh, challenged, your past uh, hurricane season, you were challenged quite a bit. So um, we'd love to hear some uh, uh, thoughts and uh, questions or whatever you may have around the, the subject matter. May I uh, jump in? Uh, sure, sure. For, for Cineproc. Yeah, uh, well, I, I, I see uh, as, I, as I work in a in a, a humanitarian response depot managed by the World Food Program and uh, was a, a part of the uh, United Nations system. Uh, well, I, um, as uh, I work with, uh, with my partners, okay, um, the stock that uh, is uh, inside the, uh, the UNHRD doesn't belong to, to, to UNHRD. We, the, 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 uh, the international, uh, the uh, maintenance response depot, we don't have legal capacity. So we, we respond as WFP, but we work for our partners, okay? We have different, um, different kinds of partners. We have three different kinds. We have governments, we have NGOs, and we have UN agencies. So we work for the humanitarian community and we uh, storage and we deliver uh, the stock that, that uh, and stock that don't belong to us. So it's not our stock; it's uh, our partners' stock. Okay. So I see the uh, the um, the uh, technology here in in in, in logistics in, in different in different ways. Okay. We have uh, in one side we have technology uh, regarding um, let's say hardware. Okay. So laptops. Uh, cell phones, uh, um, whatever, okay, um, tablets and everything. And as well for, uh, for connectivity. So uh, satellite connection, Wi-Fi connection, uh, 4G, 3G, whatever. Uh, so this is uh, one part of the, uh, of the technology, but I see technology in, in, in another way, okay? I see technology as uh, how we can improve uh, the equipment that, that we have, okay? Technology that improves, uh, <clears throat> I don't know, generators. We have uh, perhaps generators that it works with, uh, with solar, solar, uh, solar panels. 
uh, better batteries, lighter, cheaper, smaller. Um, uh, we have a cold chain, um, cold chain devices which are, uh, that uh, last longer. So that they can keep vaccines for, uh, uh, for more time or keep the temperature lower for more time. Uh, so I see uh, the, uh, the, the uh, logistics and technology in, a, in some different ways, because um, in the way you got, uh, not, you, can, you can offer not only connectivity, which is very important, uh, but also you can uh, offer lighter equipment, cheaper. Uh, you can um, uh, improve the way you, you send things and you can send more things. You can consolidate uh, uh, more containers uh, in a cheaper way. You can, and you, should, you can uh, with the same, with the same price, you can send more things to the to the uh, to the field. Okay, so that's that, that's my point. Of, my point of view, uh, taking into account the uh, the uh, uh, the position I work in. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Francisco. Okay, and then uh, Cineproc, uh, do you? Uh, I'd like to hear from uh, from you as far as uh, what your viewpoints are. And I know you were challenged over the last. Uh, uh, over the last year with some hurricanes coming in, um, into the region. So I uh, would love to hear from you. Hi. Yes, uh, the, last, uh, the last hurricane, Ota, uh, Yeta, the last years, we have uh, many challenges. The principal challenge that we have uh, is the, the communication, the, the directly communication with the community. Uh, to prevent or, or to help. In, in this case, uh, the technology that we use, we create uh, with the innovation authority of government is a, is a, a, a app, is application, is Synaproc Alert. Synaproc Alert is a free app to use by the entire country to report emergency directly to the National Emergency Operation Center, Operation Center. In our Synaproc alert, you can create a quick uh, alert, send pictures, videos, voice notes, emergency call, whatever status information. Before the app, we don't have the, uh, the information the immediately, immediately is uh, the, way, the principal problem that was working. With that application, we had all the function to allow us to allow us to receive report of violation of biosecurity measures against the COVID. You can also find informative map that show the information or any emergency in real time. That's uh, the principal use of the technology that we have in Sina province in that moment. In the logistic way uh, for transportation, human assistance, human aid, uh, we use the, the application uh, to provide more, uh, more, more comfortable and precise response and the attention of drug technology to the people in general for emergencies such uh, flood, storm, uh, road obstruction, etc. Mm -hmm. That is the way we use the technology to help to, to hear humanitarian aid to, to the people. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that uh, it's very challenging. Uh, and, uh, it's, and especially, uh, you know, with these uh, delays and, and things that are going on, uh, you know, technology, I think, uh, I think, uh, you know, we all work under some type of TMS system, transportation management system. Uh, and I uh, would love to maybe get some talk uh, uh, discussion around, you know, how, how your, how TM may play a part in, and help in humanitarian world uh, deal with these uh, unknowns. So um, who would like to maybe talk towards that point? I, okay, I, Edward. I can, I can talk. Um, okay. Okay, so in 2008, uh, the Secretariat introduced uh, an ERP system, uh, which is uh, SAP. And one of the modules that we've just introduced uh, recently, well, maybe it's a year or so, is um, team, uh, a team. TM, which is transport management. 
and that is actually helping us to track our shipments closer to real time. It's not real time as such, but at least we can manage the events. Uh, we have our freight forwarders and our vendors um, updating the system so that at least we can check and we can see where things are. And this, I think, uh, has actually increased uh, the visibility for us and also the velocity in terms of uh, transmission of information. Um, it's much faster for us because you can check and you can see where things are and you can take any necessary action or intervention that might be necessary. The only thing that I see that we are lacking at the moment, uh, besides we, for, uh, for TM, we are okay, um, it's the application of GPS technologies, you know, to monitor okay. some of these um, equipment, which uh, sometimes you get things lost at airports or some things go to different destinations. And we've had similar cases where we have a number of pilots for, of very sensitive uh, equipment, COVID related as well, where you would have thought we, where we lose a pilot. And if we had had that kind of maybe GPS technology or some kind of geofencing, to locate, to, 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 to um, monitor our equipment, technology would have helped us. Yeah, so you talked about uh, cold chain, um, you know, cold chain, uh, also the technology around monitoring uh, the temperatures of pallets and also sending notifications to the, uh, to the, either the shipping company or, and to the uh, constantly in the shipper of uh, some type of um, event that had occurred where the, temperature was compromised or the freight may have been compromised. Uh, what type of, uh, I mean, uh, from a technology standpoint, do you, do you, do, uh, you know, what, what do you see from that in um, as far as maybe some, maybe some improvements around that or some challenges or something to that effect? For us, uh, we, we really need to embrace that technology because recently we actually lost a shipment. Um, it's a cold chain shipment. They're supposed to be right. data inside to monitor the shipment, the, uh, the, the shipment is supposed to be re-iced every 72 hours. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, in this uh, location where this country is going, there's only, where, where the equipment was going, where, where the cargo is going, there's only one airline that goes once a, uh, once a week. Mm -hmm. And if there is, because these are peacekeeping operations, if there's any security situation that might not be favorable, the shipment is diverted. Aircraft cannot go. Yeah. So we've had a situation where the cargo is gone to a different location. And had we had proper technology, that uh, were well, applied proper technology uh, for that route, I guess we would have saved, you know, that um, that shipment. Right. Because... And, and, yeah. Yeah. And then from your side, um, as a as a tra uh, as a uh, air charter, uh, I'm sure you're faced with that type of same type of uh, challenge, uh, especially going to humanity into disaster regions uh, where, uh, you know, technology uh, becomes uh, a very much a challenge to to monitor shipments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we rely on speaking to the airlines to know where their aircraft are, contacting the handling agents, using tools such as flight radar and that sort of thing to see where an aircraft is actually flying at any given time. Um, we've got a 24 hour operations team who will monitor any flight that we do. And they, they will do all of that work of chasing up the handling agent, speaking to airlines, making sure that we've got a handle on exactly where an aircraft is. And, and then relay the information back to us, back to the client, back to whoever needs to know, basically. Um, so that's the way we keep a handle on where our shipments are. Um, what I was going to say is, you know, in, in terms of having, having cargo traceable, it would be handy if every aircraft pallet had a GPS tracker on it somewhere. Having rented and lost various aircraft pallets in my time, it would be an absolute dream to be able to trace the, each and every one of them. Because if, you know, even if you weren't renting them and you had no responsibility for them at all, 
just the fact that your cargo is on them. If you could just type in their, they've all got a unique pallet number on, mm -hmm. haven't they? If you could type in their pallet number to a system somewhere and it show you where in the world that pallet was, it would be absolutely fantastic. Hopefully someone can put that into action one day. Yeah. And then also, uh, you know, of course, uh, drones are becoming quite popular. So from a humanitarian aid logistics standpoint, someone have some uh, talking points towards that? Um, what, what I understand is, um, this is something that I had recently, that in some of our locations, two locations, we're actually using drones not to deliver, but to monitor. I think the drones are linked to the RFID sort of technologies. Mm -hmm and to check and monitor that certain items have been received and mm -hmm. that they're in the area. So I've been told that we have two areas where that is actually actually ongoing. Yeah, because that's actually, I mean, it's, uh, you know, especially when you go into uh, challenging regions where security is an issue, drones are probably, uh, you know, much more, well, you know, you take the human aspect of have someone having to go out and, and look at the cargo there. So Francisco, you have something to add? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the, uh, the use of, uh, of drones or even robots, I, I think is critical, it's key for the, uh, uh, for the humanitarian uh, logistics. Uh, even in, 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 not only in logistics, but before for preparedness as well. Uh, preparedness as well is, is key uh, because uh, the use of uh, geographic information systems uh, satellites and then on earth you you talk about drones or inland robots uh, mm -hmm. uh, the use of this uh, kind of technology is really important because they they give you a first hand information about how how is the field how is the uh, all, all the, uh, the, the, the 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 roads uh, everything that you need to know before you send something to the to the to the to the ground, okay. So um, uh, WFP, uh, as I told you, UNHRD, we don't have this capacity because we are just the depots. Uh, mm -hmm. But WFP, um, they they have this kind of technology and they use it. They use it. Uh, um, uh, everything that gives us a first-hand information from the ground is critical on preparedness and uh, when you have to deliver something. Yeah. Yeah, so also like, uh, you know, in, uh, in Central America, I'm sure drones and, and uh, those types of things would be very much uh, uh, in remote regions would be, you know, be really good to have, especially for firsthand information after a storm passes or some type of civil conflict. So yeah, in, in fact, today, I mean, I'm not in, I'm, I'm based in Panama, but uh, today mm -hmm. I arrived in Guatemala City. On, on Sunday because I was invited by, by Sepredenac. Sepredenac mm -hmm. is the emergency body uh, that belongs to SICA. SICA is mm -hmm. uh, the Integración Centroamericano. So it's the emergency mm -hmm. body that, um, that um, has uh, all the uh, civil protection system in Central America. So we mm -hmm. have uh, Central America and the Dominican Republic, okay? So we have uh, mm -hmm. seven different countries. Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, um, and Dominican Republic, okay? So I'm here because uh, we need to coordinate uh, uh, better all the, all the countries and they need, I think they need to use UNHRD as a, as a tool. So we are going right. here to coordinate everything and we've been uh, talking about uh, the use of, uh, of all this, uh, this kind of, uh, of, of system, okay. So, a geographic information system, drones. Here, yesterday we 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 met the, the major of the Guatemala City, and they were using drones to to warn the the people. They they show us how how they, they got drones and they got drones with a speaker to uh, mm -hmm. to, to to have the, all the population aware about uh, some emergency. Let's, uh, let's say volcano, earthquake, uh, floods, landslide, whatever. So uh, I think the uh, the use of this tool is uh, really important here in the region. Uh, and after, after because we, you know that we have two hurricanes, one after the other one, Eta and Iota in the same countries, mostly Nicaragua and Honduras, and the consequences have, have been really, really, uh, really bad. Uh, it, it, even worse than the, the hurricane Mitch 
20 years ago. So uh, the thing is that uh, we need to, to, uh, to use this kind of, of technology to save lives. Over. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, Phil, since uh, I, you're in the technology sector, uh, would you like to talk more about how you're supporting, uh, you know, uh, maybe some healthcare organizations or um, expand more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I think there's there's a couple of areas um, where we've done some some good disaster response work, especially during COVID times. Um, you know, with uh, with with providing the primary satellite network for uh, for FEMA. Uh, we had to respond to two different hurricanes uh, so far, uh, and then also um, to the West Coast wildfires. The West Coast wildfires uh, produced some unique challenges, not because of COVID, but actually particularly because of pushing a satellite signal through the smoke. We had to uh, mm -hmm. adjust our, our bandwidth remotely uh, and, and to, to give it enough power to actually power its way through and provide, provide those responders with, uh, with, with a sufficient connectivity. Um, we've also actually had to deploy people in response as well uh, with, with our Alaska network uh, that, that I've mentioned earlier, we're supporting schools. Um, we also uh, are, are supporting healthcare networks. And um, one thing that we did was uh, in the, one of the main hospitals in, in Fairbanks, um, they had to set up a mobile COVID clinic, a COVID testing clinic uh, to provide some separation from the main hospital. Uh, so our technicians flew out there in less than about 48 hours and, and provided them connectivity to maintain operations there. Okay. Um, and then, um, so uh, Francisco, could you expand a little bit more about the geospatial uh, information? Uh, is the sure. use of, uh, of the satellite information that, uh, that you get from, the, from different uh, satellites. Uh, we're talking about uh, NASA, in the United States, the uh, uh, International Space Station, and the um, the, uh, the European uh, Communication System. I, I think mm -hmm. so. you know, I don't remember for sure. But the right. thing is, the use of that technology that uh, uh, is given for free by by NASA or or the uh, the space station, and uh, mm -hmm. you can you can map is the, the you can map uh, um, uh, a piece of land. Uh, a country or whatever, whatever you need, uh, you can uh, you can uh, see the evolutions of uh, of hurricane, uh, landslide, uh, floods, whatever, and you can avoid to to uh, to um, build uh, um, buildings there or to to to, um, to to make people to to settle there. Okay, so you you use the information given by the. Uh, by the satellites, uh, and it's very useful. It uses it uh, on the ground because you can prevent uh, the people uh, to uh, to settle there and then to save lives. I, I made uh, mm -hmm. like years ago. I, I did a four months uh, training in the uh, Florida State University about mm -hmm. um, about the the use of this uh, of this uh, geographic information system to prevent uh, disasters. So I think that they are very useful weapons and tools to prevent, to prevent, this is for to prevent, uh, to save lives. And when something happened, you can use uh, the pictures that the satellite uh, can give to you to, uh, for rescuing, for, uh, uh, to keep on saving lives. So it's uh, not only for prevention, but when something happens, you can, you can use uh, this kind of tools. Um, anyone else have anything to add to that point? You know, um, you know I, I, I mentioned something about the geospatial, uh, the geospatial data. I think, that, uh, Francisco, it's really interesting uh, to, to hear how it's being used right now and how you acquire it. Uh, so DRS has partnered with uh, its, its Italian parent company um, and, and brought in some, some geospatial analysis capability. Um, we operate our own... Our own uh, uh, optical and uh, SAR satellites, and we can provide imagery. But really, I think the the unique value in it is is not so much the imagery; it's it's the analysis. So there's there's some great AI work that's done that brings together old images of of the site that we have on record with the current, and it really maps out the the current situation and helps helps those responders understand where they can go and what's what's still intact. 
in addition to that, it actually monitors infrastructure too. So, uh, you know, we can go back and pull historical data and, you know, in a, in a massive flood, we can, we can measure and see that maybe there's a levee that's bulging or maybe there's some infrastructure that's starting to fail and we need to clear out. Um, there, there's a lot of unique capability. I, I'm really interested to understand how, how the NGO community uh, leverages that, that capability and, and where it comes from. I, I fully agree with you. It's not, a, it's not an, uh, let's say, an static picture. It's an evolution, it's an historical. You need to, to analyze the, the data uh, and, the, and the, to, 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 to have a conclusion. It's not just a picture that you have in a certain moment. You need to analyze all the data, which is not easy. And you need money and you need uh, a budget to, to, to do it. And you need to, uh, to cross all the information. It's not easy, but I think it's critical. But I fully agree with you. So this is uh, really just an untapped, uh, I mean, it's an untapped uh, uh, information stream that um, is out there for everyone to, to have. Um, and I think in, you know, in today's world with uh, COVID and, and uh, you know, uh, the, the, the inability of people to travel and to get to places, I think uh, this type of technology is really critical. So, uh, you know, and uh, so, um, so, you know, we, you know, we talk about like solar devices and, and things like that, uh, generators, I, you know, they keep evolving and, and things like that. So anyone want to talk more towards that as far as, you know, technology towards, you know, that, that, that in, uh, side uh, that uh, the humanitarian aid um, uh, uh, field would be interested in? I've got something very quickly about drones. If that's okay. Sure. So I can completely see the, uh, the advantages of being able to use a drone uh, or a UAV for assessment of damage immediately after a natural disaster, for example. One of the main things that we work on immediately when a a disaster has happened is to find out from people on the ground what the situation is with the airport ultimately because that's where we need to get to as charter brokers and people that are sending aircraft in there and I think that it, with all of the information that you may be able to get from a drone it would be difficult to persuade any airlines to land at an airport without actually getting a report from people, you know, on people that are on the ground at that airport. So one of the big jobs that we do very early on is to make contact with the authorities and with the airports to mm -hmm. establish exactly what's, what's damaged, how much of the runway is usable, et cetera. And mm -hmm. then we share that information throughout the company and as far as we possibly can to to help the general aid effort. And uh, I think drones definitely have their place, but I don't think they can replace that quite yet. Right, right. So yeah, you know, the, that, that in industry sector is definitely people uh, dependent uh, and I, it's gonna take some time. So, um, but also um, coming from uh, Cineproc, uh, love to hear some more about your alert app and maybe how how that's helping uh, helping you uh, and the uh, and you know the the NGO community. Um, okay, the the app helps to do the the main benefit of application is to provide a comfortable and precise response and attention through technology to the people in general for emergencies. Uh, we before the app we work with uh, uh, with the information what we receive in the ground uh, by by the inspection we we send people the people make the the evaluation of the of the area and then come to the office and we have to 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 make uh, uh, the the other to assist with the app we have a uh, Directly communication with the with the people with the with the area, 
um, will uh, improve the, the, the time of the response of, of the emergency. That's uh, the, the principal uh, advantage we have in this. In this, I mean, we have a low budget. We have a, a low budget to, 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 to technology. Uh, more this is the, the last the situation of the COVID is, uh, is no the good uh, time to 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 inversion to, to the budget to make the budget mm -hmm. to, to apply to the to in technology. But that app uh, is a, a step to to forward to help the the, the community. Mm -hmm. yeah, in the, so in this way. Yeah, uh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, anyone have any questions around that uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to Jaime? Okay. So um, coming from uh, go ahead. Sure. Sure. Is the app available in Spanish? Is it available in Spanish? Worldwide, worldwide, okay. it's worldwide. Uh, right. You can um, see the app in, in App Store, in in um, Android and iOS. Okay. You can see the, the app. And then you can use the app for information on the situation, like which is evolving. That's yeah, we have to use the app to to, for example. Uh, you with the app, you can send a uh, quick alerts. You can send picture of the situation. You can send a, a voice note. Uh, you can send emergency alert. You can make alert with that. Uh, everybody can uh, send alert of any emergency situation. Okay. Uh, even you say you have a flood, you have a storm, uh, even a car accident, you can send the alert with that app. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So from the UN, uh, does the UN have anything like that, uh, like uh, Center Park has uh, described um, in the areas that you serve? No. OK. Uh, not really. Not really. OK. All right. So, um, <clears throat> so from um, it, so from some of the uh, other, you know, some of the other talking points, um, uh, you know, the uh, the renewable energies, uh, things like that, uh, uh, those types of things, uh, you know, uh, as technology changes around that. From a renewable energy, uh, you know, the renewables is that changing the industry of, uh, you know, uh, how we respond to. Humanitarian aid disasters, uh, technology, to anything to that that effect. I think one. Well, I I want to add something. Uh, to answer sure. Something. That uh, I think that they are getting more more efficient. Okay. So um, we uh, and I'm talking uh, mostly about uh, um, solar solar panels. Okay. So solar solar energy. Mm -hmm. uh, we. Uh, um, uh, we are in the, uh, we have a division inside the UNHRD, which is called the UNHRD lab, lab of a laboratory. And we are uh, always testing a new different kind of technology. And um, for instance, we are um, doing an, an um, uh, it's like an inflate little warehouse for cold chain. And we can use it with solar panels. So uh, why is that? Now, because we are improving the uh, the way out how we we get light and we we convert it in, into an er into energy. Okay. So they are more efficient. They are lighter. They are cheaper. So we can we can um, try new things with that. No. So we can. Um, they are um, more reliable. Okay. So so we can. Uh, Sometimes we can count of the solar energy like an alternative source uh, instead of energy or fuel. So for for our, in our side, I think we can we we, we are trying to, to incorporate the solar energy like a, like a reliable uh, uh, source of of energy. Yeah, and I'll give you the example of the little cold chain 
warehouse, inflate warehouse. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm interested in uh, lear uh, learning about some of our success stories around, uh, around COVID-19 um, and, um, you know, some things that you've learned, lessons learned uh, during operating in this new environment. So I just kind of go around the, each one of the panels, panelists and, uh, and, um, and uh, see what you have to say. So Ben, would you like to kick it off? Their own countries for a lot of these people. Um, following that, we've arranged charters. I mean, on go we moved in in the financial year 2020. Uh, 30,000 tons of PPE to 64 different countries. So that was the extent of our activity. And it's, uh, you know, that that's, I'm really proud of the whole team. It's been a spectacular effort. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, Phil? You know, I, I think what we, what we learn, and uh, if I may kind of tell a, a story of, of our experience or one specific story of our experience with COVID, but I, I think we learned what we already knew that, you know, our relationships with our customers, with our suppliers and with our employees are really the most important, the most important element of, of, of dealing with, uh, with responding to COVID. Um, one of our one of our uh, customers uh, has us operate a uh, an international uh, communication network that's a combination of terrestrial and satellite uh, networks. And um, recently, we had to uh, it actually it was April of 2020. So just as as COVID was really starting to to lock the world down, uh, they they required a, a hardware upgrade in order to maintain the cert security certification. Um, which typically would, would be challenging, but manageable. Uh, you know, we would, we would fly our technicians to all the locations around the world where we would have to make upgrades to the equipment. Um, and, and over the period of time, we'd roll out the new equipment and, and then update our network. Um, but with, with quarantines, with travel restrictions, with, with shipment challenges, uh, we, we had to find a new way to do it. Um, now, it's really specialized equipment, so we can't just send anyone out to do it. But we were able to partner, use that partnership with our supplier to develop work instructions and, and operator trainings to get local people to go in and do that, do those upgrades. And we, we then they would fall back on our uh, global network operations security center for the support as they talk them through it. Um, so in that process, by, by partnering with a customer to, to provide an alternate method to upgrade their network, uh, as, as well as partnering with our suppliers and then partnering with the people, the local people on the ground who are actually able to go out and reach that. We we're able to make that full upgrade and, 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 uh, and provide them with a main, maintain the security requirement on their network. Um, once that was complete, the new network was stood up. Our, our, we have a secondary support site that actually went through and transitioned each of the 4,000 terminals that use that network onto the new network. So Really, I think that the core of it is while we've got that existing infrastructure and we have that uh, we have that general capability, we had to leverage those partnerships that we've developed over 20, 30 years of operating and doing this um, in, in our experiences. So to me, I, I think the lesson is that, you know, you've got to you've got to learn to maintain partnerships and, and keep people up front that so when something like this happens, you have that that credibility and that flexibility to respond. I think I'll also add to what Phil just said because this is one of the things that we've learned. Um, our relationships with our vendors, because I'm from the procurement side of things, where we 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 try to make sure that our relationships are not adversarial with our vendors. We become more like partners. We share information more closely with them, so they know what's going on. We know what is going on. So that's actually been a lesson learned. At the same time, we've also learned to be very pragmatic and innovative um, within the limitations of public procurement. 
you know, within the limitations of the rules and to make things happen, to make sure that we do not delay things mm -hmm. uh, with any bureaucracy. At the same time, coincidentally, we are having this event. We are actually looking at how we can actually optimize the, uh, the technologies on um, logistics, basically on our supply chain that are available on the market. I've actually been looking at to see what we can uh, adopt, how we can use what we currently have at the moment. That's uh, what I have. Yeah, thank you. Francisco? Yeah, I think uh, this, uh, this COVID uh, ha, ha, uh, has given us the opportunity to be more uh, imaginative and more inventive. So um, I give you an example, this panel, okay? I've never thought that we could <laughs> make a panel here uh, in, a, in this uh, platform. Now we have uh, Zoom, we have uh, Skype, we have uh, Teams, we have a lot of platforms that uh, we can communicate, communicate with each other. And uh, we never thought about that. We were traveling all the way around uh, and with, uh, with uh, uh, professionally, with providers, with, uh, with a lot of people. I, it's the first time I, I, I've seen personally through this kind of platform providers that never I thought I was going to talk with, uh, with them. So I think it's an it's a opportunity in one way to be more sustainable and not taking the plane for the, to meet uh, your colleagues or your providers uh, every uh, every month or whatever, uh, but uh, using this kind of platforms to communicate to communicate with uh, with uh, everyone. I mean, now I'm having meetings with uh, with my colleagues in China, in Kuala Lumpur, in Dubai, almost every week. Uh, and um, the, two weeks ago, we had the, our the UNHRD Global Partners meeting. I've never thought we were going to have this this kind of meeting through Teams. And we did it, and I, and I think it worked. And this kind of panel, this uh, action for disaster relief, I, I never thought we could do, we could make it like, like that. And it's working. And I, I see everyone there, and uh, I'm sitting here in, in, in Guatemala City or in Panama, and, uh, and we can make it. And I think this uh, this is a, an opportunity to uh, remake some things, to be more creative, and um, to to take advantage of the technology uh, to meet each other even though uh, of, the, of the restriction, despite of the restriction, we are, we are having this panel and, uh, and I think it, it, it works. Mm -hmm. Javi? Um, the most uh, amazing thing that the COVID made to us is, uh, like Francisco says, uh, the technology helps us to, to, to reduce the time, reduce the distance, um, also, the, the, the most important thing in the world is the development of the technology in this last year is more, uh, it's more accelerated to help to, to get out of this problem. Uh, example that is for, for us, that uh, app is something that we have to plan to have in three years in the future, but we have the app in today. Uh, the the situation makes us it make the country and make the government more innovation more efficiently uh, to help uh, it to make things that the uh, in, in last in past times we go so far no we today we use technology to help people for example in Panama in Panama we uh, call ID cellular uh, it, today the people the government can help people use this, uh, this car, this cellular, the ID, they have a, a money to buy a food. Uh, it's, for me, it's, uh, it's something amazing that how you can help a million of people uh, in Panama with that technology. That technology was developed in the last uh, eight, eight months. Uh, okay. That is the technology helps yeah, uh, the the main hope how you use the technology. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think uh, you know from our side, and thank you, uh, uh, Jaime. I think that's uh, excellent, and thank you to the panel also. But also from you know from the standpoint of uh, Radiant, um, and I you know I'll uh, I'll uh, uh, concur with what Ben and Francisco and Edward said, and Phil. I think everyone said it. It's really a partnership. 
it's really it's really uh, firmed up our partnerships. Uh, you know, you really find out who your true partners are in, in today's environment. Also, it's uh, required us to become more innovative. Um, and, uh, and, and, and to talk to Jaime's point, well, and speed up technology. It has sped up technology tremendously um, with the lots available out there. I think it, you know, it, uh, it was time, you had to do it to survive. And so, uh, you know, from our side um, at Radiant, um, <clears throat> I know when uh, we got the call from, uh, from FEMA that uh, we were going to be handling over a hundred charters in a two month period, coming out of China, uh, you know, when our staff was being quarantined, uh, you know, and we were having to go remote. Yeah, it was a challenge for us as, as a company, uh, you know, to, to have our staff, which were normally in offices, now working out of their homes. How do you do that? How do you get the phones to ring? How do you do, you know, communication, that whole thing. Uh, so we had to develop very quickly uh, as, you know, to how to, 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 to operate. Um, and, uh, you know, and we looked at, um, as, as I've done over the last 15 years, you look at it just like to go along with Ben said, you looked at COVID just like a, a, a disaster. You do assessments around it and, and, uh, you know, and, and try to mitigate as much risk as you can. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, we are definitely in uncharted waters and I think, um, uh, you know, with, uh, technology, it's, uh, definitely stepped up. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, with partners, uh, you know, that uh, we work together and communicate, um, I think it's a very, very critical for, um, you know, moving forward for, for any type of uh, humanitarian disaster and response. So thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, and um, thank you again. Take care.